Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans. There's a new kind of powerful test in town, and, and it's called genomic sequencing, where we don't just map one gene, but your whole genetic code. Genomic sequencing is evolving quickly. Its use is still uncommon in the clinic, but, but this is starting to change. The thing about genomic sequencing is that it can provide us with useful information, like helping your doctor identify a genetic cause for your condition or, or help or tailor your treatment. But the thing about genomic sequencing is that it can reveal a lot of extra information about many other disease risks which are unrelated to your condition. This is what the geneticists call incidental or secondary findings. Some of this extra health information might be helpful, some might be confusing, some might cause anxiety, and much of it we simply don't know what it means for your health yet. The good news is that you have a choice as to which incidental findings you want to learn about. I can think about this in advance, and in this whiteboard I'm going to give you the basics and, and a bit of a framework to reflect on. Okay, now that I've got your attention, let's do a little genetics 101. Your genetic information is contained in your genes, which hold the instructions for your cells in the form of DNA. You've probably heard of the long twisty ladder or double helix, which is the structure of DNA. You can think of your entire genetic makeup as a book. For a while we've been able to read pages of this book, or, or a few genes at a time, but now now we can read almost the whole book. It's what we call a genome. Reading most of or your whole genome is called genomic sequencing. As we mentioned at the top, when we map your genome, we get what my kids would call TMI, too much information. So to help you decide in advance what you want to know about, it may be helpful to think about your genome as a book divided into five chapters or, or categories of disease risks. This will help you decide which categories or, or chapters of your book you want to open. Category 1 is what we might call the most actionable. Here we can discover whether you have a gene that has been clearly shown to raise your risk for certain diseases and where there are proven therapies or preventative strategies available to help reduce your chance of developing those diseases. Category 1 can also tell you about your response to certain medications. For example, in the course of a medical workup to find a genetic cause of a woman's condition, a doctor orders genomic sequencing and happens to also discover she has the BRCA1 or 2 mutation, kind of like a spelling mistake in that gene, which puts her at high risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer. This BRCA1 or 2 mutation is an example of an actionable incidental finding because we have a preventive strategy, such as increased monitoring, mammograms or, or MRIs, or some women may choose to have surgery to remove their breast and or ovaries. These are all proven strategies to help reduce chance of developing breast or ovarian cancer. Category 2 includes your risk for common diseases such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and some cancers. This may sound helpful, but it's, it's really important to know that these changes in risk are typically small. And that's because these common diseases are caused by multiple genes, some of which we know of and, and some of which we don't. Either way, your genes reveal only part of your risk. Other factors such as diet and exercise, life circumstances, they may all play a much stronger role. So you can change your lifestyle, better diet, exercise more, smoke less for sure, but beyond that, there aren't proven medical interventions to reduce these disease risks. Small changes in risk can be hard to put in perspective. Let's say genomic sequencing shows your risk of type 2 diabetes goes from 10 to 13%. How do you frame that? Do you say to yourself, there's an 87% chance I won't get diabetes, or a 13% chance I will? How do you take into account the fact that only about a quarter of the risk for type 2 diabetes is genetic and three quarters is brought by your lifestyle behaviors? Will this data help you be more vigilant about exercise or diet or too vigilant about common symptoms that you think may be a sign of diabetes? Now, category 3 can reveal current or, or future genetic diseases. So, for example, muscular dystrophy, a genetic cause of troubled muscle function, or, or Wardenberg syndrome, a genetic cause of deafness. We don't have effective strategies to prevent diseases in Category 3. Again, this makes us wonder whether we want to know. The disease may be severe or mild or somewhere in between. Knowing early might help life planning or treat symptoms earlier, or just cause more anxiety. Category 4 would reveal early onset brain diseases. So illnesses like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's have very rare genetic forms that strike people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So for example, this is about 5% of Alzheimer's cases. Again, we don't currently have a preventive treatment for these early onset brain diseases, but this info could be helpful to make preparations. 
Results in Category 5 assess whether you are a carrier of a gene that might cause disease in your children and your relatives' children, but does not cause problems for you. So, for example, cystic fibrosis, fragile X syndrome, sickle cell anemia. There are exceptions, but typically how this works is if a person who carries these genes gets together with another person who also carries the same gene, their kids have a higher risk for developing these types of illnesses, many of which don't have cures. So this category is about whether you want to know risk for future children, not necessarily about your own health. So hopefully now you can see this is actually a complex decision. But if you do sign up for genomic sequencing, it's likely you will get to pick which categories of incidental findings you want to look into. So if you say, hmm, I want to look into category 1, 3, and 5, but not 2 and 4, you might learn that sequencing did not find any specific disease genes in those categories. Or you might learn that you are at high risk for breast and ovarian cancer and muscular dystrophy and are a carrier for cystic fibrosis. Because you did not choose category 2 and 4, you will not learn about whether you are slightly higher risk for diabetes or, or whether you will get early onset Alzheimer's. These are just a few examples since there are many more disease risks included in each category than those I've offered here. I should also say that if you do decide you want results from a category, you can't pick and choose diseases in the category. You get the whole category. So, for example, if you go for category 5, you're going to learn about all of the available information about genes that might affect future generations. Okay, now let's think about incidental findings and how you might personally handle all this information. I think we all process and use information different ways. So, for example, some people might only be interested in testing for things where risk of disease will change a lot, or only for illnesses that you can change the course of before they happen. Maybe you think knowing about an incurable disease well in advance is too distressing. Or maybe you feel that knowing early that a disease is possibly coming helps you and your loved ones prepare. Some simply feel more information is better and, and this leads to better decisions. Others are happy to let nature take its course and, and they will focus on what they can control, healthy behaviors. So you can see, faced with the same information, people draw different conclusions. Another angle is, what will be best for my family? When you learn genetic information about yourself, you also learn information for your children your siblings, or even parents and cousins and so on. Family members should know that when you sequence your genome and learn your incidental findings from any of the five categories, it could have an effect on them. It may be helpful news, it may be bad news, and sharing this news may affect your relationship with your relatives, perhaps triggering more questions than answers. The best time to have a family discussion about genomic sequencing and whether to learn about your incidental findings is long before any results come in. You could also consult with your doctor or a genetic counselor. One more consideration is whether you can be denied insurance or employment based on your results. This varies by province, state, and country, so it's important to know the laws about access to genetic information where you live. Oh, and one more consideration. It's important to think about cause and effect whenever we start testing people. Your results could trigger more questions or even a cascade of more and possibly invasive testing. It's important to remember because risk for disease is usually multifactorial, most risk estimates are fuzzy with genomic sequencing and, and results are not black and white. You could have a high risk for disease but still never develop it, or you may be at low genetic risk but you get the disease anyways. Another thing to remember is that there are lots of genes that aren't understood yet or can't be analyzed. So it's important to remember that negative results doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have any risk genes. It simply might not have been detected in the analysis, so you can't rule out your risk of having any disease. We just don't know all the answers yet. On that note, as our understanding of the science of genetics advances over time, our interpretation of your results could also change, which begs the question, how do you keep abreast of new science that affects your findings? The current reality is that this will mostly be up to you. So in the end, you're left with some big questions, often at a time when you're already having some health challenges. Do you want to open this book? Do you want to see some chapters and not others? Is getting more certainty about health issues worth more uncertainty about others? Will knowing about small shifts in risk help or, or just cause anxiety? Will the results change your actions? Considering these trade-offs in advance, as, as well as your own style for processing information, makes for a better decision. There are no right answers here, just your answers. Thanks for listening.